So in the second video, looking at this uh, ENL VTE-1, we'll go ahead and do a teardown. In the first video, we unboxed it. We took a quick look at the externals of the case, the badges, etc., and the original manual. I have taken that original manual and scanned it, cleaned it up a bit, and printed a copy of it to work from. Uh, as I typically do, I will make the you know, PDFs of this original manual uh, available uh, up on probably archive.org. It cleaned up really well. Uh, it printed really well. So I'm happy with that. The schematics are a little tough to read. Uh, so there's an insert page here that was an extra page 40A versus 40. A little bit tough to read there. So I went ahead and included a color scan of the same schematic. And then a hard black and white. Uh, which is probably the easiest to read, and I've done that for all the schematics. We have the next page here. Uh, well, if I can get the page to flip, the color version of it, and then a, a, a hard conversion to just straight, straight black and white, no grayscale. And I've done that for all four of the pages, and then as I typically do for my old eyes, I've printed out larger versions of it, which actually turned out pretty well. Uh, I don't know why there's red mixed into the black here. This was a black and white image. Uh, I think my printer's actually having issues. Not all four of these have the red in them, but I haven't actually pursued that. I've read through the manual. Uh, it's mostly assembly. Because there was no check marks in any of the assembly steps in here, I'm guessing this was a factory assembled unit. We'll find out when we get inside. I think the quality of the build will potentially tell us that. Um, it's got this slope top here. I don't know if you can see it. The slope top with this little rim, the idea is a monitor could sit down on there uh, and give you a nice angle for working at it. Uh, it's a little bit thick versus modern stuff. You'd probably need a wrist pad, but it wouldn't be that hard, I think, to work with. The manual was pretty straightforward, pretty typical. Uh, there's a a couple interesting features on the motherboard we'll take a look at, but the next step I think here is to get the case screws out. If I can keep from dropping it. And take it apart. So it appears to me that the case screws are these ones around the outside edge. Hopefully I'm in camera here. Oh, I can already see a nice brass insert in there. So it's a machine screw with a nice brass insert. That That's a nice feature, thank you. Uh, another brass insert. So, well, that's designed well. It does take a lot of weight because of the monitor on it. So this top does need to be, a, a, you, know, you know, somewhat strong. And oh, I thought that was a scratch. There are a few little minor scratches on it. But again, it's in remarkably good shape. Uh, there's some tape residue under the keyboard. It'll be interesting to see if I can get off without damaging the plastic. I haven't even just begun to decide how to address that yet. Uh, yeah, nice little brass inserts. These are all coming off very easily. I know from looking in the manual that my guess, based on the photos I had seen in the manual, that the keyboard's a membrane keyboard seems to be correct. It's got two connectors down onto the motherboard. No surprise, I'm assuming an X and Y. Uh, you may have noticed in the video here I've already removed the 220 volt plug that was on here. I wanted to see the colors inside, and, it, and it's you know, American Standard with uh, hot, hotter line, neutral, and earth ground. I'll have to order a 110 volt plug to put on there. Let's uh, flip it over. Actually, I think I need to go in this way. Take a peek inside. And there are indeed ribbon cables. Oh, they just pull right loose. Okay. Take a look into, oh, I see what they've done. Rather than solder the little connectors that the ribbon cap or that the, the 
flat flex pushes in too. They put some kind of socket on here. That's why it came apart fairly easily. Uh, or maybe these are permanently attached. No, that looks like the socket you'd slip the cable down to. Anyhow, that's a nice little feature. It made this easy to unhook. Let me set this aside. Well, actually, other things I'm observing here and looking. Of course, there's the four metal straps that hold the keyboard in place. Uh, I don't know what these two screws there do. They may be for kind of wedging it in place somehow. But what, what I'm noticing is these are all heat stakes and they're all flattened out. So there's no screws to remove the back off to get to the membrane. It would be literally a remove all those heat stakes. Oh boy, if I have to do something with the membrane that will be unpleasant. Uh, I guess we'll see. Hopefully the keyboard will just work. I don't get the impression this has got a lot of hours of use on it, just based on the condition of the keyboard. So it, it may be okay. Uh, as we expected, it is wired for 230 volts internally. So we can see that the line cord comes in through the fuse, switched on and off, and then the 220 is on the outside connections here, and the two center ones are jumpered together. There's actually a, a picture of that someplace in the assembly manual for how to wire it for 110 or 220. I know I took a guess at it in the first video. Uh, and couldn't remember how to do it. So there it is. So it's currently wired for 230 volt AC because the center two lugs are tied together and it's on the outside. And for 115, we jump it the way it's shown here. The AC comes in on two terminals, then those two terminals are jumpered the other two. So we will convert this to 115 volt AC. Uh, I noticed in the schematic, it was kind of interesting. There are three diode bridges down here. There's a, they're all three full wave rectifiers. The large one is for the plus five power supply. There will be you know, a bit of current consumed here. And the two smaller ones, one's dedicated to plus 12 and one's dedicated to minus 12. And I found it interesting that they used full wave bridge rectifiers for the plus 12 and minus 12. We can see this on this page here where there's 10 volt RMS, full bridge, full, full oh, cannot talk. A full wave bridge rectifier filtering capacitors, 7805, and the output for plus 5. We've got the same thing here, full-way rectification of an 18-volt source to plus 12, and full-way rectification of another 18-volt source to be used as minus 12. So it's interesting that it's wired up that way. It's f Oh, I see why they did that. That's interesting. It's using two plus 12 volt regulators. They're LM340T-12. But they're using the ground side. So this is a completely isolated, each one of these is a completely isolated DC supply. And because this third one's completely isolated, you can make the plus 12 output of the 7812 ground and then use the negative output to produce a minus 12. So that's why those are fully isolated. Um, Interesting. You know, typically because the plus 12 probably isn't that much current, you would use a full wave rectifier, but that would require a center tap transformer. We obviously don't have a center tap transformer. So with a center tap, you can actually produce a plus and minus voltage rail and the center tap becomes ground. That's not what we have here. So this is shown wired for 115 volt AC and it is labeled as such. Uh, is there anything else to note here? I'm just kind of surprised that there was two full wave rectifiers, one for plus 12 and one for minus 12. Uh, but now I understand why. Uh, this was interesting. On the schematic, there seems to be a logic probe built in. Uh, I found it in the assembly notes, which is kind of interesting, so we'll look for that. So let's take an inspection of the actual PCB. The unit is extremely clean inside. There's a little layer of dust. Uh, that's no surprise. That'll clean out. Uh, 
no surprise at all that's there there are some uh, vent grills on the on the front of the unit so a little bit of dust has gotten in but you know there's no insects there's no cobwebs there's no dust bunnies the 1702 is called the Character Decoder. And what's interesting is ASCII data comes into it. It's kind of a, almost like something you do in the modern world with a PAL. Uh, character data comes into it, gets decoded, and eventually it produces the bell signal. So if a control G comes in, uh, it'll take bell low. There's a bunch of signals here. Minus 1, negative 64, negative carriage return, plus 1, plus 64. There's a bunch of signals here. Line feed. Uh, I can't tell for sure. But it's just interesting to me that this is used as a decoder. At first I thought this was where, uh, you know, maybe the operating code lived in the thing. I had the impression in my head it was microcontroller controlled for some reason until I actually looked at the schematics. Uh, instead, I believe it's just a state machine implemented in TTL logic. Uh, but, you know, it's producing right. It's just interesting that this is what it's doing. Uh, these are 74 LS 42s. You know, it's got an ABCD input, so it's got four inputs. It, it, you know, it is a binary to some number of outputs decoder. Uh, this one is decoding seven bits, five, six, seven, because it's got three basically address lines coming in. This one's got all four coming in, four, five, and it's only got six that are used there. It, that's interesting. We've got two 40 pin dips. This is a 1602, so that is a UART. TR1602 is a UART. And based on what I saw in the schematic, this AY52376 is a decoder. It's what's driving the X. You know, it's what's dr scanning the keyboard. So it produces the outputs and then looks at the inputs for the keyboard. I do not remember seeing the keyboard any place in the schematics. It's probably here and I just missed it. That's all memory, character ROM, and the RAM. There was of the keyboard. I knew I'd seen something, but is on this page. So there's that AY52376 uh, decoder, and it's got what I'm assuming are a bunch of outputs. Oh, interesting. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I think those hmm, are probably more the keyboard connectors okay so that's the two keyboard connectors they've just labeled the signals a through z that doesn't mean the letters a through z and there's a shift uh, I'm assuming it caps lock X four five six and seven there's lock two and lock one there's a control and then there's the Y bits uh, repeat common so it's an XY scan I just don't know how the keyboard is actually laid out Again, you probably have to tear apart the keyboard and and look at the membrane to figure that out. I see a bunch of jumpers down here. Baud rate. So this jumper's in goes from 75 through 9600 baud. If you're running the 110, you move the jumper over to these pins. Uh, there's a common up there, it looks like, that gets jumpered to one of these down here. And it's 75, 150, 300, 600, 1200, 2400, 4800, 9600 baud. And if you have this in the 110 baud position, this becomes 110 baud out as well. Uh, I believe the 110 baud is for a 20, a 20 milliamp current loop connection like you'd have going to a TTY or a teletype. Otherwise, it's serial output. We kind of looked at the back of the unit. We can flip it up again and look. We've got the back of the unit. We've got screw terminals. And we've got four screw terminals down here for the 20 milliamp loops. 
the out loop and the in loop, and then we've got RS-232 signals here, which is, but it's labeled as uh, signal out, signal in, oh, common in, common out. That's interesting that those are different grounds. And this is wired for com out to com in, signal out to signal in. This is, somebody's put jumper wires on here to act as a loop back. That's just interesting to me that the commons are separated, if I'm interpreting what those commons are correctly. Obviously a little speaker down here. Uh, so control G can beep. Uh, there's a little transistor amplifier here for driving the speaker. Of course the transformer. So the more I look at this, the more I'm guessing it's factory assembled. Just because, you know, the guy that did the assembly did a good job. Uh, and I say that based on noticing things like where the wires are tied or soldered to the motherboard here. It's very consistent. They're bent over the same way. They're soldered the same way. It's a very consistent job. So somebody did a really nice job with that. Looking at the diode soldering, or not the diode, the capacitor. So we've got the filter capacitors here. I don't know which one is for which voltage rail. Um, but they are soldered on both top and bottom of the PCB. So there's where the lead comes in on the upper pad, there's actually solder. That's something I do as well, typically. I just think it makes for a neater, a nicer build. And typically you have to solder these tops yourselves. It may be the solder flowed through okay. But there was enough soldering. I think it happened from the top here. I suspect these wires were put in and soldered from the top. I don't know that, but I would think that would be a little easier way to do it. Uh, I'm just suddenly realizing there's not a lot of despiking capacitors. I'm assuming those ceramics there and here are despiking. There's not anything really over here. Probably some despiking caps there. Probably some there. So they didn't follow the design pattern of every chip gets a spiking capacitor, unless they're on the other side of the board. And I doubt that's the case. Uh, again, looking at the soldering to the switch, to these terminal lugs here, the way the wire's wrapped onto them and the soldering is very consistent again. <clears throat> so whoever put this together knew what he was doing. You know, was comfortable with the soldering pencil. I'm guessing factory. I'm also kind of guessing that because of the sticker on the transformer. Labeling it for 230 volt. Uh, so this was probably soldered up you know, it, 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 in the ENL factory. The wires coming off of the secondary of the transformer aren't quite as clean. But they are pretty consistent. The job that was done here, little things like bending that loop, that loop over. Uh, I don't know, I just get that impression. The shrink tubing to the connections on the voltage regulators aren't burnt, meaning somebody didn't use a lighter or match to shrink the tubing. Uh, which means a heat gun was used, which again is kind of a sign of a professional build. Uh, yeah, those are soldered directly onto the legs, which is fine. Just a little loom of wire that comes up to these solder joints. I wonder what this large capacitor over here is. Oh, okay, so there's That's part of the plus five. So we've got the 7805 sitting here. Uh, so that has to do with uh, filtering. It's 2200 microfarad, 16 volt. Uh, it's got to be, you know, plus five, probably the minus 12. Well, it is the minus 12 and the plus 12. There are some tantalum caps here as well. I'm looking to see if I can read one of them. 
oh, it's 10 microfarad, so there's six of these large tantalums. Uh, they're typically used for decoupling as well. So I think overall the decoupling is really nice on it, and they've done a good job. I personally would have had more 0.1 microfarads out in the field, but I overkill with them, honestly. Uh, and of course, the more capacitance you have in decoupling, the higher the initial current draw when you power it up because all those capacitors have to charge. Uh, transformer is well mounted, it's not loose. It's proper strain relief on power cord coming in. And I don't see any signs on here. Somebody used a pair of pliers to install that themselves. I don't see any marks, meaning the proper tool was probably, I think the proper tool was used to put the uh, strain relief in for the power cord. Again, a sign that was probably factory built. Connections to the video look absolutely fine. I believe this switch here is serial or uh, RS-232, if I remember right. It does have the lowercase optional ROM in it as well. So there's a 2708 here for the uppercase character set. And there's a second one for the lowercase character set. So that's nice to have both in here, upper and lowercase. Uh, very nice. There's an IJ jumper here, jumper for upper only. So I guess if you didn't have the lowercase mod, you could jumper these two, and then for lowercase, it would force it to still use the uppercase. Uh, that's nice. As you can see, there's a C of TTL on here. I'm just noticing that sitting the way it is, the pin one is to the right. So the markings on all the devices in my field of view are upside down, but the silk screens are upside right. That's interesting. Uh, that's not something I would typically do you know uh, it's designed around I think from the manual we saw 79 for my Rev G the manual so this was designed sometime before that and I can't honestly tell looking at the board if it was hand taped it almost looks to me like it was machine laid out which is interesting uh, just because of the way the angles are. It, it isn't smooth transitions as things flow. It could well still have been hand taped. Uh, clearances and things look excellent on it. I mean, they've done a really good job with it. Of course, this is later in the life, I believe, of VNL. As their quality come up. It's a nice heavy metal chassis bottom, uh, which I like as well. Uh, in ENL's typical fashion, the voltage regulators are heat sunk directly to the metal chassis. I think that was true for every device when I was a collector and for the couple of pieces I still have left. I am noticing lots, well not lots, but devices with lots of uh, oxide on the pins. There's two of them here and I believe that's got a Fairchild marking and that's got a Looks like a TI. I'm pretty sure TI was still silver, silver plating leads back at the time. That's a Fairchild, Fairchild, Fairchild. Let me flip this around here and we'll look for some date codes. Hopefully my eyes will be good enough to see them. So I did, don't have my flashlight up here. Well, I have a light. Hopefully this won't blind the camera. Let me get some light here. Uh, D2102 AL 200 nanosecond. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's a full 8 bit wide memory, which is nice. Uh, which means you've got the full 127 normal character set, I'm assuming, available because of the two ROMs. And then any, you know, there may be extension characters. I don't know. Uh, but it's full 8 bits of storage, which is nice. Uh, they are NEC chips. Looking for date codes that I recognize. Not sure on those. 
lots of markings, but some you know date codes are not always obvious. Fairchild parts. Huh, give me a standard formatted date code here. 43rd week of 80, 44th week of 80, 44th week of 80, I believe. Another 44 week of 80. Uh, 18th week of 79. So yeah, they, these are very consistent with the manual revision. The manual, I believe, was revision G. Yeah, manual revision G, 9 of 80, so September of 1980. So from a manufacturing date point, this looks like the, the, the device itself is pretty close. Uh, to the manual, yeah, TR-1602, definitely a UR keyboard scanning. Hopefully we're not getting hot spots on the camera. Apologies if we are. I need the light. Uh, 78. 12th week of 78, 12th week of 78. Can't read it. Ninth week of 80, 14th week of 80, 47th week of 79. So yeah, I think we, we've established when this was assembled early to mid-1980. There's this jumper link here to the keyboard and a trace cut. That's interesting and it's double cut. Uh, again, somebody who knows what they're doing, the double cut, is he actually peeled the foil off. And he's peeled the foil off between the cuts. So that's something I will do, double cut and then peel the PCB foil away. And that way, if you've just got a single cut through, you know, like, like, like you often see from, you know, Somebody just takes an exacto and makes a single cut. It's possible for that to reconnect. Little bits of you know solder can get in there or whatever. This this produces. This has got an eighth inch gap here, and he's really scratched the copper out. So that is always going to be disconnected. That is another sign to me. Probably professionally assembled. That solder joint with that said isn't great. That was a via. The vias are open, so they can be soldered to. They're not. There's a term for it when they're coated over. I can't remember what the term is. Uh, you know, it looks to me like it's an FR4 PCB, a fiberglass re resin impregnated fiberglass. That would make sense. Uh, I wonder what that jumper link there is. There's been a couple of these jumper leaks floating around. There's a couple up here. I don't know what they do. I don't remember spotting those in the schematic of the assembly manual. All capacitors not specified are 0 .01. So the these spiking look like they're probably 0 .01. Oh no, because they're specified. Are they specified? C20. No, there's no value specified on those. So the these spiking look like they're 0 .01. Typical. All ICs not fully specified are SN74LSXXX series. So it's mostly LS series. And that's what I'm seeing looking at the board. Lots of LS logic. Six pin device here. There was an opto isolator. I found it someplace in the manual mention. I don't remember what it was for. A little six pin device. Almost always going to be an opto isolator. There is an op amp LM four fifty eight. Oh, I need more light. LM four five eight or four five six RCA port. Yeah, it's an op amp. I'm not sure what it would be for since this is linear regulation. I'd have to go back and look at the schematics and figure it out. Uh, I think this crystal was about 11 megahertz. It goes through a divider chain to produce the various video timings. We see that in the schematic. Uh, it's on this first page here. 11.088 megahertz crystal. It's pretty typical using a couple of 7404 inverters. 
to produce the clock train. There was a dot clock. There's an anyhow clock coming off labeled dot. I'm assuming that's the dot clock driver. Dot, dot clock driver. So the unused gates are pulled high. It's a spiking cap sitting on the capacitor kind of threw me. Unused gates, the inputs are just pulled high. That's typical. You don't want them to oscillate, especially when this is oscillating internally. Uh, you want to do something to terminate unused gates so they don't self-oscillate. That just increases current flow. 161, 161, 161, they're dividing out. Uh, the video stuff, I'm assuming picked off here someplace, are the clock uh, for the serial, you know, to produce their various baud rates. Uh, vertical sync, horizontal sync, vertical blanking, and screen data, I'm assuming that's basically the dot clock, are brought in here. Mixed, uh, 75 ohm terminated. And just a 2N2222 as a driver, which is absolutely fine. Um, the bell signal comes into an LS123. It's a one shot. Uh, and S6. I don't know what S6 is. S6 is going to be a S6 right here. So it's part of the divider chain. So you, you're basically probably dividing by, I, I don't know, you're dividing by 2, 4, 6, you know, whatever. So that S6 output is going to be clocking because it's coming from the video circuit that's always running. That's gated through a 74LS08. When the Q output of the one shot goes high, that drives the 2N2222, which drives the speaker. So that makes perfect sense. So all the system timings generated up here. What else to look at here? I'm going to have to inspect. I'm debating here. I see no reason I wouldn't power this up and check it for functionality. Uh, at least get a measurement of the voltage rails. You know, the wiring is done well. You know, these are just signs to me. This, you know, whoever did this was a very good electronic tech or even a professional. You know, whoever did this, the wire lengths work out that the looms are nice and clean. Uh, it just seems to be loomed up, you know, very nicely. It's Well, it's not loomed, it's wire tied, but, you know, there's no craziness with links. There's nothing jutting out between the wire ties. The wire ties are, are solid on there. Uh... Pretty sure that fuse looks intact. Yeah, that fuse is intact, so it hasn't blown a fuse. It's a good thing. The equipment comes to you with a fuse blown. That's always a scary sign because something caused that fuse to blow. Oh, I know what else I was going to mention is visually looking at these capacitors. I see no signs of leakage. My guess is these caps are absolutely fine. Uh, the plus 5 is on a 16 volt cap, and the plus and minus 12 are on 35 volt caps. Uh, this was 10 volts RMS, so what about... Eh, it's probably 14 volts working, that's awful close to the 16. And these were 18. So the, in the maybe 27 volt working range, we'll have to measure them. Uh, this one might be a little bit close to what it's actually trying to smooth. Oh, I'm debating whether to pull the PC board off and take a look at the back side. I know you want to see it, and I know I want to see it. There's just a lot of hardware holding it on, so I would want to remove all this hardware off camera. Uh, and that's going to be difficult because these wires are so short so the voltage wires have to come loose there's a fair amount of work to getting that PCB loose that honestly would be boring so maybe in the next video we'll look at the back of the PC board do a little bit more tear down and make some measurements anyhow I hope to see you in that video we'll talk soon